Um, the feedback on the uh, facing race, embracing equity, and the discussion on race. See, you were at both of those. I was. I was at both of them, and I was, I was at neither. You were, you were at neither, and you were at the facing race, embracing equity yeah. Yeah. workshop they had. Um, what was your impression of both of those? Well, I just went to one. Yeah, well, well. Yeah. I don't know. I Frankly, I don't remember that much. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, there, there is, if you, if you want to, there, there is a, um, they ended up sending us a, a copy of uh, two pages of the notes that they took from that meeting. Oh, nice. And those are posted on location 19. If you go to the uh, March 26 minutes, about halfway through there at the end of the session of where I had written down the few things that I remembered from it. Uh, I put the link to, to these notes here where they, they reviewed um, what, you know, the, the topics they, that were discussed. Um, I think uh, my recollection, without going through and reading everything they had, was uh, um, that there was a lot of concern from some of the teachers, and I think uh, Eva Thomas, the principal from 19, was there also. And it sounded like uh, there, there isn't as much in-service or training for staff as anybody thought there should be. Was that your take on the discussion there? Yeah, it's, it was news to all of us with Vision Quest Project when Eva Thomas shared that it is part of the district's professional development plans and goals to have one PD session per year on culturally responsive education. And I can say with some confidence, I don't believe I've ever been to one, I, that I did not self-select mm -hmm. myself. I mean, I know this year is an anomaly with, with the fact that we don't have building-based professional development that's mandatory anymore. But I've been teaching you long enough that you would think that I would have just tripped over it at some point. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the reason they don't have it anymore is because they did away with the uh, half-day Wednesday yeah, thing. Yeah, the early Wednesdays, there's no more mandatory professional mm -hmm. development. It's completely voluntary. Well, the professional developers are still held accountable as to what percentage of teachers report to various professional developments, and uh, their reviews are based upon that. Yes, they have, we have been strongly encouraged to go. <laughs> yeah. I have maintained a principled stance that it is not mandatory as the building union rep, fair, fair to say. No, I... I like, I, I, that, is, that is interesting. I was wondering why we were being hustled to meetings. Um, one, one of my coworkers' wives is actually one of the building development uh, staff and, and um, is essentially in, in trouble with her, her bosses for not having maintained a high enough um, <laughs> okay good luck and, and has been very frustrated with the, the situation this year but um no i wasn't finished really okay so, what were you saying no no but, uh, no uh, about that meeting with the race thing i remember um no, don't say sorry, because this was uh, yeah. a few chapters ago, but um, I, I was glad that I went, and um, the, one, the one thing I do remember is that there is fear, at least one, one lady uh, who I was sitting next to, um, mentioned the possibility of gentrification um, in the 19th Ward mm -hmm. with everything that's going on, the, the hotel having been built and now this new dorm going up and then they have a dorm on Plymouth Avenue not too far from here. And I, I uh, mentioned that um, some years ago when they put up housing, new housing, um, near the river, um, 
on some of the dead end streets that go down there, like Flint Street and some of the others. And possibly, I guess it would be Exchange Street. I don't know, but there was a fear from the um, Plex neighbor of the Plymouth um, Exchange neighbors. And the city assured them that there would not be gentrification, that they didn't have to worry about being taxed out of their homes. And so I believe that that still is uh, so. Now, I don't know about the 19th Ward, what's going to happen there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember, I think it was Adam, um, Adam uh, McFadden who had yeah. said that at some meeting that I was at, that the city was trying to ensure that there wouldn't be, people wouldn't get taxed out of their homes. Of course, it's one thing to say it, I'm not sure what, what actually got passed as far as any laws or regulations that they would follow. But anyways, that's been a, a, a concern for some yeah. neighborhoods, for some people and for others. You know, they, I remember talking to another councilman who basically said, gee, I, I own property there and if the value goes up, all the better. <laughs> you know, so. And most people would rather see the neighborhood be prosperous. The question is, right. will the people who live there right. uh, benefit from the prosperity? But yeah. Yeah. What they what they had, by the way, Sean, at that meeting, the free meeting, they they there's th that group, the uh, uh, facing race, embracing equity, has been meeting for a number of months, and they had one one subgroup that was for um, educational issues and they had three three statements that they had come up with that they used as talking points for this meeting one was every Rochester student will be able to read write and do math at or above grade level or to the best of his or her individual potential uh, one was the Rochester City School District will increase the number of educators of color and in partnership with free um, race and education work group, uh, develop a comprehensive ongoing professional development process for all Rochester City School District employees. And the third one was authentic opportunities will be created for caring parents, guardians, and caretakers who are in a position to participate uh, equitably in all major decision making process at the school and central office levels. And then based on that, the group kind of went through, you know, making statements of what they, they saw and um, I thought the thing was pretty free ranging. There wasn't too much facilitators didn't rein it in much, but um, I think that you know one of the things that concerns me when I you know, coming away from it is we really need to have teachers going through this a lot and you know and I sometimes get frustrated with contract regulations I mean it should be mandatory for all teachers to to have you know extensive training in in that uh, in you know ethnic and uh, racial sensitivity to really understand where the kids are coming from, what sort of stuff they're hearing at home, because if they come in with one viewpoint and the teacher is oblivious to what's going on at home, it makes for a lack of communication because you know, there has to be a rapport between the two people communicating. Um, now, what what is the union doing proactively in, in that? Are you oh, aware? well, the union offers, I would believe, the most mm -hmm. culturally responsive education training of any entity in Rochester mm -hmm. through the Rochester Teacher Center. Mm -hmm. I we, so we were just this Saturday finishing up a series on new teaching and learning schools in urban environments, and based on the book Seven Constructs of, in, of Urban Education, written by Dr. Susan Goodwin. Mm -hmm. um, it's 
like this, this it was actually that the at School Thought Walls on Saturday. This the they had they brought in national clinicians and nationally recognized um, Af Afrocentric history professors to come in and speak to us about the culture of the uh, Africa, African diaspora from around the globe, mm -hmm. and that was three different PD streams. Like we're talking. 20, 25, 30 hours of professional development culminated in that workshop and they had three different tracks working and the room was filled standing room only. That was the so meeting you were in when yeah. I yes. stopped by. Yep, yep. Mm. And yeah. there's, there's quite a bit of it available, it's just not necessarily mandatory. Now, wouldn't you think that, I mean, that when things need to happen to have the overall organization be effective, uh, whether it's the teachers union or the city school district that says, okay, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're working um, in this area, you need to have training in this area or be competent and display it or you know, show that you've had the training. Wouldn't it make sense that if the city school district isn't mandating something like that, that the teachers union might mandate it for people to be part of the union because it's in their interest to have the best trained organization going. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more, uh, more power for them if they're mandating it and controlling it and hopefully if they're uh, effective at it. Uh, you know, they have a, a better claim at giving eff effective training. Um, it would seem like that would be an opportunity for the union to, to shine, basically, and to, to be recognized as being very proactive. Uh, if, if they're offering all this and it's available, but the teachers who most need it don't bother taking care of, you know, taking yeah. advantage of it, which unfortunately sometimes is the way things go with training. I don't know. Well, maybe I'm. I'm extrapolating from, from my own background in industry, but um, what's your what's your view on how do how do you get the the teachers who aren't cutting it, and there are some, how do you get them involved in in taking training and and welcoming it and you know getting involved with it? To me, that was the, that was really the whole point of the building-based professional development. Who knows what it's going to be turned into next year? They are renegotiating different things going through to next year. Maybe the Wednesday meetings will be back, but they'll be between four to five p.m. on a Wednesday. There are very, there are actually, I believe, no districts in Monroe County that do not have a weekly mandate, who do not have a weekly mandatory professional development. And I see that as the most appropriate venue. And if there's, it's already in place, that mandatory mm -hmm. training, it's in place on the books downtown. The issue has been that downtown is not enforcing it with the, with the um, buildings. And I see that as an opportunity for uh, central office to reach out to the union and perhaps co-provide the trainings. I don't necessarily see it as the union's job to, as they're not the employer, mm -hmm. to require one thing or another as a stipulation of ongoing employment. I mean, they don't employ us. Mm -hmm. They are just a professional organization. Um, I certainly do agree that it should be mandatory. And it, the, the sad thing is that I feel like the ball was dropped somewhere along the line. The union is still providing it, but they're not the ones that can mandate the training. Center office mandated the training, but is not necessarily providing it. I would love to see, personally, more responsive building-based professional development overall. The reason that I've been maintaining my principled stance by not going to professional development in my building is because it often does not pertain to me. After eight years of teaching, they're, if they're speaking about ELA strategies, for an hour that is not an effective use of my time as a right. music educator. That's mm -hmm. where I that's where I am with it. I would love to see the union and the district partner more to really allow people to tailor those Wednesdays, make them mandatory, but tailor them to what is 
effective, what is most effective for them to do their job well. And unfortunately, right now, that only the, the tailoring only happens after the fact. If you're rated um, through APPR as developing or ineffective, then you are mandated to bring those particular areas in which you are rated uh, developing or ineffective up. Where maybe uh, I believe part of the Danielson rubrics is, and I, I feel confident it's not the specific wording about culturally responsive education, but it's in there. It's in there. You could rate development or ineffective, in, developing or ineffective, and be required to complete that training. It's just unfortunate that it's after the fact. After the fact. Mm -hmm. at, at, it's after if they were able to proactively get ahead of it and provide the mandated training that the district already requires of its employees. But right. it's just. I've been in many buildings. I don't believe I've attended. I'll be really generous and say maybe there have been three occasions where I would say it has been a culturally culturally responsive like race and education style workshop in within the context of a building based mandatory professional development. If they were providing that beforehand, it would be unlikely that teachers would be rated developing or ineffective in those areas. Unfortunately, okay. right now, they're, okay. because okay. they're not providing it, oh, you have to do no. the training after it's already... Oh, yeah. They've yeah, already yeah, been yeah. teaching that. crappy for years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, right now, the the district has... According to Eva Thomas. Pardon? According to Eva from School 19. Mm -hmm. It's in there. It's in there, but they, they weren't enforcing it. Yeah, I don't think. What or or, or were they, did perhaps, they lose the ability to enforce it when they no, did away with the be, afternoon? No, uh, a downtown uh, central office administration speaking directly to building-based administration because you have to submit your building professional development plan, the professional development plan at the beginning of each year. Say this is what I'm going to do on this Wednesday throughout the year. You have to plan it right out. Mm -hmm. It's not something you. And you have to submit downtown. So I'm, I can only assume the ball is dropped downtown or that they're taking a really broad definition of what would be culturally responsive education. Mm -hmm. the, on, on that note, not knowing how the power structure of that lays, is, does, does that ultimately fall under the purview of the, the principal or is that considered independent of the, the, the review and responsibilities of the principal? The principal is obligated to provide appropriate building-based professional development for their staff. I, I, again, this year is an anomaly, but up to now, they were in charge of facilitating the Wednesday meetings based on staff input saying, we would like training in power school one day, or we would like training on close reading, different things that they want to see happen throughout the year. And it's a part of a negotiated process through school-based planning team and building committee. I want to say school-based planning team rather than um, building committee. And it's something that's in conjunction with the staff to be able, and gives them the flexibility rather than downtown saying, you're going to do this, 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 and this to tailor it to their building's needs. Which would assume to me that Carlos Leal is depart. He's the head of professional development or professional learning downtown. Mm -hmm. Someone in his department up to this year, I can imagine, had been looking at these professional development schedules, and whether it's in there or not, I don't. Somebody's green lighting it and not maybe saying that this is, this needs to be happening. Or they're, again, taking a very broad definition of what that would be, and they're kind of wiggling things in. I'm, I'm almost thinking, based on the mess that they're in downtown, the issue might be that they're trying to cram in ELA and math training and Common Core ramp-up training, and anything else is gravy. I, I, we found it very difficult to get a Wednesday at our building to do... Uh, or two Wednesdays to do uh, school uh, school wide uh, SWPBS school wide positive behavior systems, mm -hmm. which is something that's really necessary to having good education to have that whole school behavior system working and working effectively. But when you're waist deep in the big muddy, it's how yes. can we move these kids? That's yes. one of my job is dependent upon. 
and the principals don't necessarily want to cede that control of that particular Wednesday. So it may have been considered a frill and jettisoned. Yeah, so, yeah I imagine that the Common Core had a big effect on what mm -hmm. they've been able to mm -hmm. do in, in that. But, but you're it's saying that, that over the course of eight years, though, that you haven't seen it. So it's obviously not something that's just, that's just happened. I mean, it, if you're yeah, saying, it's, it's if you're saying that this disappeared core. four years ago, then, then no. okay, with the bringing in of the new standards mm -hmm. and trying to bring people up to, to speed, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, yeah. sure. But it, over the course of eight years, this is, it's, it's something that's lost in the notes at mm -hmm. best. Yeah. Now, is, is there, if I go into a school and I say, show me what, which teachers have had training in this, this, or this, do they have a log of who has taken you know, in services on particular topics? Is this something that there's a record? Not at the building level. I would, if you wanted to have that kind of, an, kind of answer, I would go to Carlos Leal's Department of Professional Learning downtown, and we are required at the end of every year, based on your certification, you can opt to do a paid 36 hours of professional development each year, which I will say the majority of teachers do opt to do that, and that, that's 36 hours of professional learning every year. You self-select, and then you have to justify your choices. You can't just take the same thing every single year mm -hmm. and have it count. Then, the, then there's the other tier that's the, the TIF plan that you could do 72 hours of professional development. And now the state, this is where the state comes in. Anybody re receiving teaching certification after a certain year, I don't even, I want to say it's like 2005, 2006 kind of area, is required to do 175 hours of continuing professional development every five years in order to maintain their certification. I mean, they're required to do it. And that was prior to this year covered by the building-based Wednesdays. And if you just went to the building-based Wednesdays, every five years, you'll be good. So, so it's been kind of a, a, a challenging year. Like there is mandated, mandated professional development at the state level, and then that rolled over into the district level. Liz, this has been such a, an interesting year for mm -hmm. that. There's a lot of fun talk like, okay, you can double dip for certification. You, can't, you don't necessarily get to double dip. What are you double dipping? Can you get paid? And the, it's been very confusing. Con very confusing. It was not thought about ahead of time. It was a cost saving. Let's, let's say they, they gained instructional time, but they bought a mess of other headaches in terms of certification and whatnot. If they continue this, I predict there will be teachers losing certification within the next couple of years, and the city will be in a pickle. 175 <laughs> hours. That's. What, it's, uh, it's about 35, 36 hours a year ish, ish. Oh, for five they got to take it. Yeah, oh, you, you, okay. It's, it's so not all years. in one. No, that would be. Okay. Yeah. It would be crazy, right? Yeah. So if you space out over five years, the 36 hours would cover it, or the 30 right. whatever hours of building based would cover it, but we don't hmm. have those anymore. So it's going to be a real challenge for the union and the district to try mm -hmm. and hash this mess out. So that people don't start losing their certification left yeah. and right. Not, not to throw time onto your schedule, but mm -hmm. it, it, essentially it, it would be what one week a year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. About one additional week of training, but most people. I mean, you could do. There's, there's certain different regulations. You can do up to 22 hours during. 24 hours of that can be during the summertime, and the rest is. Okay, so you, 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 the, so the district couldn't, like, for example, say. Uh, you know, finals are on this week. The week following, we are going to have a 40-hour work week with a all they professional better development. Mm -hmm. They better pay them. <laughs> with, with, with regard, you know, not taking into account no, pay I'm, on that at all. I'm just saying for scheduling yeah. reasons, if, yeah. it, that, would that legally fall within those requirements? Or sure. is that out because of the 24 hours over the course of the well, summer? Well, they could just write that into the... the um, con, con, uh, the collective bargaining agreement that could be a negotiation point and I can see a lot of teachers saying yes I, I would love to do that then I don't have to take my time on my nights and my weekends I've worked every Saturday and some Sundays since February doing professional development of some kind or working for some way in the district I would love to do that but it's going to be a real the, the, the 
fun punchline that we get to hear a lot is, that costs money, we can't do it. And you yourself have been going every Saturday and Sunday since February? And yeah. You said, wow. Yeah. yeah. I'm pretty tired. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. that's what there's a lot of good teachers across the district doing just that. I you now, know, this is things they do on their own time. On their or, own time, mm -hmm. it's it's professional learning. There's, a, I would say, a significant portion, maybe the top ten percent or fifteen percent of the teachers in each building that are doing instead of the thirty six, they're doing fifty sixty hours a year. I was doing fifty sixty hours a year, and I continue to. I probably have more than that this year. Mm. I'm just not gonna get paid for it. Mm. Okay, so. um, while well, um, at it, uh, on the um, discussion on race meeting that we had on April 9th that we had over at oh, the library okay. there, uh, what was your take on that? How did you, uh, did you find it useful? Uh, I thought it was terribly interesting, and like I said at that meeting, it was a good juxtaposition because I was actually going through a series on race in our community with my church through the Lenten season and to see the absolute appalling differences between individuals on the edge of Irondequoit, still in the city, but at the church on the edge of Irondequoit versus Phyllis Wheatley Library, it was a very different discussion on race. Mm. So it was... It, Wow. It, it made me up. In fact, I actually stopped going to my church's series because it was a lot of scared white people and I didn't want to hear it anymore. So yeah. I, I really would have liked to have gone to the, wow. Gates, to the Gates meeting because that was one the following week. Yeah, and see I, what the difference I got sidetracked and didn't make it because it would have been nice to see, you know, the same, I'm not sure if it was the same facilitators, but, um, mm -hmm. but I didn't make it. Um, that, that's one of the things that you run into, you know, depending on what uh, environment people are in and who they're talking with and what they're, you know, they develop their own set of fears, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, some people are deathly afraid of getting shot going down Thurston and I'm mm -hmm. thinking, well, there are a lot more people that get killed in a car accident than get shot going down Thurston, but that, then there are others that will commute Two hours to work or something. Yeah. Two hours to work? You know, people that will commute an hour in and an hour back and heaven knows what the, the risk is there. But oh, it's oh. a lot of what you, mm -hmm. what you, um, you know, the model of the world that you create in your mind is what stirs I, your I, emotions. I think that the, the largest influence on the, the, my model of the world that ever happened to me was as I was graduating from high school. Because I because I did have an IEP, mm -hmm. um, Vesed came in and gave me an interview, and and my ex, um, the the vocational education for the state of New York, Vesed, um, they they came in and gave me an interview to make sure that upon leaving high school I was going to be properly taken care of and figure out a way for, to go forward and have a profession and a career. And one of the questions they asked me on my exit interview was rather it bothered me to be a minority in my school, and it was weird because they said it and it really actually was the first time I had noticed. Because I grew up in the inner city my entire life, I had been going to city schools my entire life, it had never occurred to me that, that the, the, the racial mix that was in my school wasn't the norm. You know, that, you know, I was, at, at that point it was a 25% Caucasian mix in the city schools. And that that wasn't the norm for the U.S. Really, like, like literally them asking that question my senior year was the first time it had occurred to me mm. that that wasn't the norm. And, mm. I, and I had to respond, you know, no, it didn't bother me until just now. <laughs> <laughs> when I said, wait, what's the rest of the world like? You know, <laughs> and that, that's the kind of things that they were talking about. A lot of different people, and we, I mean, there was even individuals that were from uh, countries in the Caribbean giving their perspective on what it meant to be black in their community and the racism in their community I at, at, that. at, at yes. uh, in I want to say the Dominican Republic. And then she moved here and she said, 
she said she felt that she met more racism from people of ostensibly her own race than from right. mm-hmm. uh, from white people and people members of the majority culture. I just thought it was really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it wasn't. I remember now? Thank it was, you. It was, for it was really interesting, frankly. That. Yeah, it's uh, well, we we always tend to look at you know other races or groups of people. They're Asiatic. Well, gee, there there are umpteen different nationalities there, and they all see each other very differently. And there's some of the same thing in in the minority community in in our city. That depending on you know if there's actually straight from Africa versus African American mm-hmm. versus Jamaican. That, or, that that made for some interesting bedfellows at at, at Wilson because it was one of the places where they were taking in and uh, placing refugees coming in. Mm-hmm. And so the the, um, the Somali refugees that were coming in, in, in horrible ethnic cleansing civil war, both sides were getting stuck in Wilson, and because of that internal racism within the school, they were literally finding each other as the only friends that they were able to, to grasp onto because of the fact that they were so incredibly straight off the boat, dark-skinned, that that they were you know being shunned and like well I don't care you get over here you know like <laughs> forming forming a weird bedfellows click that wow. you know that you would have never expected wow. yeah. out, outside of the U.S. I hope they continue having these kind of discussions on race in the community and I almost would like to see, I would like to see like you said more crossover because I patch. Big money. It was a very different discussion in Gates. Oh, Maybe yeah. not in Gates so much. Brighton was before that. I bet it was a very different discussion in Brighton than it was in yeah. Phil Sweetie. Yeah. I, uh, is there anything, you know, that as the education committee, can we try to maybe do or invite some of these groups to come in periodically? You know, at special meetings or something like that. Uh, I don't know. I haven't. Uh, I'm not sure. Did they say what the any follow-on programs they had for at that meeting. I don't. The, uh, yeah, I don't know that they had any more there. I would. But this is Southwest Education Committee. Why not reach out to the Rochester Teacher Center? Mm-hmm. I mean, they're bringing in national clinicians on the regular. Norma, Norma Lemoyne was in on Thursday and Friday who did a whole series on language and African-American students, why they're failing because of a language. It's a language barrier issue. I don't see why not. They're pretty, they're pretty open where they would say, come in. In fact, she invited it, said anybody that comes to see you for Vision Quest have them come in, have them come see what we're doing. And they, we, when we asked previously, could we bring community members into these workshops, they said, please, by all means, mm-hmm. please come in. So okay. that might be worthwhile talking to uh, Dr. Susan Goodwin, who heads it up. Um, Jenga St. Louis is on the staff there, Yolanda Montalvo, but I think Dr. Susan Goodwin is the director of Rochester Teacher Center. It might be something mm-hmm. that the Southwest Education Committee might want to reach out to and see if there's anything coming up that they can start engaging neighborhood mm-hmm. with residents to go to that place. Because they have them a little bit every, they mostly they do them on Hart Street. That's where they're built, they're, okay. um, mm-hmm. they're based out of. Yeah. But it's not too far away. Good, I think uh, that would be a good thing for us to, to do because I, uh, it's one of the things that is always easy to overlook and you know, not not get into the the racial issue. People tend to run away from it, mm-hmm. but I think it's so important for what's going on in, in our schools and in our community. Mm-hmm.